came here today to uh, see uh, Peppy Sanders and to uh, commiserate her because her Mets lost to the Kansas City Royals, which are undeniably the best team in baseball. This it's always next year. She, uh, or, fortunately for us, brought her hubby along. <laughs> will give us a nice uh, presentation about Frank Lloyd Wright. And I uh, asked Harris a few things about his background. I didn't want to go into it too much. And uh, he went to Penn State to study architecture. And uh, he could tell you a little bit of the story. Uh, he, with his uh, buddy, uh, Jack Quackenbush, designed this building we're in right now. So that's uh, uh, pretty impressive. But uh, we've been uh, pestering him for many years, because they're regulars uh, in book review. Hey, Harris, you know, when are you going to give a presentation? And we finally uh, talked him into it. And so we're uh, glad to see him. Harris, come on up. Overhangs and so forth. 
Uh, now I'll go into the, uh, uh, let me see, I got my notes back on. Oh, I, I, I want to mention he also uh, created a number of uh, very well-known buildings. Now, uh, one of the earliest ones he's done was in, the, in Japan, in Tokyo. It was the uh, Imperial Hotel wanted to build a building, but they, the site that they picked was on quick, what was all earthquake material. And they asked somebody in Europe who was known, that knew about Frank Lloyd Wright, do you think we ought to retain him? And they said, he's an engineer, he's an inventor, and he'll do it for you. So anyways, back in 1915, Frank Lloyd Wright designed this, oh, this uh, 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 more of a, a resort type hotel that took almost a city block. And instead of putting the building on the rock, like most buildings are, he decided to take the building foundation and put about two or three feet of clay on it. And he designed the bottom of the building like a boat. So if anything happened, it would move back and forth like a boat. Well, this happened in 1923. They had a tremendous earthquake in Tokyo, and this particular building was the only one standing in the area that they had this quicksand. So his, his engineering and his principles became world known. All right, now, uh, what was the other one? Uh, uh, Is that it? Yeah. yeah, okay. Then the other buildings, well, uh, since that time, he uh, did a number of buildings that were well renowned. But the ones that we would know about is the Guggenheim Museum. Now, the Guggenheim Museum started off in the city of New York. Land is very expensive, and they had a restricted amount of land that they could work with. And as a result, he came up with an idea because Museums have to be on a level of land, like, or, or a floor, take an elevator to the next floor, and so forth. And this was six floors high. So he designed a building that was like a continuous spiral ramp that went all the way around and kept going around and around until it went from the sixth floor down to the first floor. And everybody used to get in there, and they used to go up to the sixth floor, get off, and then Walked around very easy, very easy walking. Some people had wheelchairs, no problem. And it worked all the way down to the first floor. And it became a renowned as far as the type of museum it was. And that's what's very historic. Um, the other building that uh, Frank Lord Wright designed is uh, Falling Water. And I'll talk about it a little later. All right, now I want to go to the uh, I want to go into the story about falling water. Let me see if I get these pictures. Okay. Going back that? Okay. This is a picture of falling water. It's a private home built down in Bear Run, Pennsylvania, which is about 60 miles to the southeast of Pittsburgh. And uh, it's probably the most famous building because of its unusual characteristics. Now, I'll go into that too, but I want to go in there and show you the background of how this house got started. Now, the owners of this house, they had a little cottage in this area. It was about 1,500 square feet, and uh, very beautiful. They had a stream going right down to the bottom, and this was done for Mr. Kaufman. And Mr. Kaufman, had a very uh, play, uh, we, we talk, uh, more of a, a beautiful uh, hotel, uh, uh, excuse me, apartment house, and uh, apartment store in Pittsburgh. It was a very uh, interesting one. It became so famous, it made, it made Pittsburgh the shopping area at that particular time. And then eventually, Macy's took it over, and that's what happened to his department store. But Mr. Kaufman, we call him Mr. Kaufman Sr. He had a son named, uh, same name, of course, but Junior. 
and he had a wife named Lillian. And they had a place just outside Pittsburgh. Well, Pittsburgh in those days, this is, I'm talking about 1933, something like that. In those days, there was a lot of smog in their place, and everybody tried to get out of Pittsburgh because it was an industrial town. So he was very fortunate, had this big piece of land, he had a cottage on there. And that little cottage was a weekend cottage. Well, he decided he wanted to build a more a elegant house because he enjoyed going out of the cottage and going fishing along the stream. Well, he got a hold of uh, his son, by the way, uh, Mr. Uh, Edward Coffman Jr. Went to uh, work, not work, he was an apprentice with Frank Lloyd Wright. Now, Frank Lloyd Wright had a place in uh, Wisconsin that he called Talesian, Talesian East. He also had a place out in at Scottsdale, Arizona, which he called Talesian West. And it was a very interesting thing because he started off as a school. He taught architects, he taught artists, but very, very much of an artist comedy, sculpture and all that stuff was taught there, but he also designed buildings, and he designed hundreds of buildings, and uh, beautiful stuff. And somebody asked him one time, what is your favorite building? He said, the last one I built. <laughs> so it's very, very easy on these fast things. Anyways, the one in Arizona, my wife and I were out there at the school there, and Mrs. Wright, she was still alive then, uh, she was telling a story. She said to Frank, told me one time, and I tried to correct him. He started telling me about what he said at the court. She said, I've heard what you saw in court. He was an expert witness on some big building or something. And he said, uh, he said, what do you mean? What did I say was so wrong? She says, you're very egotistical, Frank. Said, you're not very egotistical. She said, you went up there and they said, you think you're, you're the greatest architect in the world? And you said, absolutely. <laughs> he says, you never said sure. something like that. He says, Ojina Ojilla, Ojilla Bonnie. That was in the old show, Ogavani. Go on, he said, don't you know I was under oath? <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, he was considered, in those people for the years, one of the greatest thinkers as far as architecture. All right, now I want to go into the, uh, the background, pretty much, of uh, the uh, Coffins. I told you about the fact they had this place under there. But anyways, uh, this place in uh, Bear Run, Pennsylvania. And uh, their son was going to uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's school in Wisconsin, which was Calvinistian East. And uh, the, the father was telling the son that this little weekend of, and the weekend house is not good. We want to do something better. So he says, I want you to meet Frank Lloyd Wright. He's my instructor. We have a great number. We spread them out. We expect for him. And we want to let you know that he'd be the perfect person to design this house. Well, Frank Lloyd Wright was an individual. When he built the building, he always sat with the client, studied the client, what they did, their habits, and he did what they call organic architecture. He wanted to put pe people and buildings together, and that was his whole theme of the school, and he taught that to, for years. Well, anyways, they got Frank Lloyd Wright as their architect, and he decided to go look at the site and so forth. Well, he looked at the site, and it was a beautiful moving stream all the way down. He says, this is a great place to put in a building that's organic. So anyways, he went ahead and he went, made some plans in, in uh, Wisconsin, in his office, and he invited the Kaufmans to come up and see the uh, building, but he's resigned. Well, Mr. Kaufman Sr. and Mr. Kaufman Jr. and uh, his wife, Lillian, <laughs> and uh, they went up to Wisconsin and they looked at the plans. So Mr. Kaufman Sr. says, Mr. Wright, you didn't do what I told you. He says, what do you mean you didn't do what I told you? 
He says, you think you forgot my screen. He, I, I want to go fishing on my screen. He says, Mr. Kaufman, he says, this is your house. It's part of you. You got to remember, I would never forget the screen. I put the screen right through the middle of the house. <laughs> and it was in the lower basement area. He says, that's where it's going to be. A screen is not to look at, it's to be part of. He says, so that's why I put the screen directly on the middle. And the son told him, oh, that sounds very logical. So anyways, he went ahead and he built the house. They built the house, it was finished. I think it was 1936 or 37. And it became a world meeting place. People from all over the world. Albert Einstein was there when I was there once. once. And, and people from all over came to this place. They made it like a, you know, first of all, it was designed as a year-round house. That heat and everything else, the first one did not. And uh, everybody was using this house as a meeting place. So eventually he did, found out he had to build some guest houses because they want to stay over and they had meetings and so forth. So they went ahead and had get they started building guest houses there. Um, I'm trying to get an idea right now of the uh, let me see if we're what was the next thing I did? Huh? Okay. I was in uh, well in nineteen forty six after World War II, I, uh, I came back from the Navy. I got discharged and I went back to Penn State. And uh, I decided to uh, continue my course in architecture because it was so exciting to me. So anyways, I'll just read you a little bit about what I did there. Uh, my, first, my first instructor at this, this school, one of my first instructors was a personal friend of Edgar Kaufman Jr., who was up in Wisconsin. And he talked to him about if we could go and get Mr. Wright. Mr. Wright, which was, Mr. Wright was in the area. He was doing the construction, and here he is. Can he stop in at our school and talk to the students, you know, the, the group of architects who were very interested in it? And he says, sure, I'll talk to him. So Mr. Kaufman, Jr., talked to Mr. Wright. He says, when you're in the area around Bear Run or, or where the, the uh, falling water is, could you stop in and talk to him? Well, he came in, oh, excuse me, I didn't mean Bear Run, uh, Penn State. Penn State is right near there. It's about 90 miles from Bear Run, and uh, Pittsburgh is about 60 miles. And, uh, he said, so he stopped in at Penn State, and he looked at the place, and, and the teacher was very proud to have the greatest architect in the world in our class. He said, here he is. So the first thing your instructor said, Mr. Wright, what's your impression of this place? And Wright got there, he said, this place is exceptionally beautiful. You've got the most beautiful campus in the whole place, but your building's ruined. <laughs> so, so anyways, after a while, the, uh, we, the group there asked Mr. Kaufman again if we can go down to visit a fallen water. So a group of us piled into a couple cars and we drove 90 miles down to fallen water. So when we got there, we had a meet with, they called him the Project Architect. And his name was Edgar Topfel. Edgar Topfel was in school with Frank, I mean, he was an apprentice for Frank Lloyd Wright for about six years. And uh, he was one of the top men involved in the design of Falling Water. And um, Edgar Topfel took us around and gave us a tour of the buildings. And that's what I want to talk about next. I want to put on. Where's one? Oh, this is the way we came down. All right, good. The parking lot was up near the top of the, up the, near the upper section of the hill, and we had a walk down to this walkway on the east going into the building. And uh, we walked all the way down, and that was the entrance. 
Now, Frankenhardt Wright has certain theories about architecture. Number one, you never put the front door facing the street. Let people walk around the building to find it, and they'll see you building it like a piece of sculpture. So the building was wrapped around this whole section. And we had a walk around here, a beautiful walk, out of our building, and we finally got into the entrance. This is a group of us going into the entrance. You notice there's a, a series of layers of building here, which is very, very interesting because the rooms, the uh, landscape here, was all sandstone ledge rock, and it more or less took the same shape. Now, we walked in through here, and the uh, first thing I noticed, Mrs. Kaufman Sr., Mrs. Mrs. Kaufman, Mrs. Kaufman, she used to raise Joshua's, and I saw four of them running across the lawn, and I just like to look at myself there. And I said, boy, these dogs are perfect for this. this <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, I'm not the first impression here, I can always get those. So then we came to the entrance. This is what this is close to the entrance. Right, this is the entrance. Next one. Next one. Yeah. Right, this is the entrance. Now, if you notice the, uh, the restricting wall between the entrance here and the entrance there, yes? that was the width of the entrance. Now, he deliberately took this stone. This, by the way, is the native stone. <laughs> he took this stone and restricted the entrance. He said, by restricting the entrance, and putting a low ceiling, once they open the door, the rooms will look twice as big. And that was his theory. So then we went from here into the living room. Well, this room here is roughly 30 feet by 30 or something, 30 by 20 or something, I forgot exactly. But the uh, building itself had windows all around, and you made sure you could see everything out here. So it's a connect window. This is, this is a fireplace. You make that look sharper? All right, this is a fireplace that was there, and this was a jug, and that jug had cider in it. And you used to take the jug, and they swung it into the fireplace, and they heated up the cider. <laughs> and when this house was originally built, there was a hole on the ceiling, on the ceiling, and when it rained, water went down, and they had a big vase underneath it, and they had a drain to it that went into the street. And he said he wanted the building to have a sound. When it rained outdoors, he wants you to know it. So you did the rain kind of that. And he said, that's the way to hide it, to make sure in with the house. Anyway, that's what he did here. Well, what's that next? Well, this is the other thing. Now, this is a piece of glass, and that's the corner. Minor glass, and he always believed open up the corner. That's what it looked like on the outside. And he always wanted to open up the ends. He didn't want restrictions. He wanted you to see nature all around. So he did it here and there. I'm just trying to show you some features of the house that you don't normally see. That's right. Oh, this is another thing. Here's a corner window. Here's a casement window. Window open like a door. Well, Mr. Kaufman wanted a big table, and he says, oh, you blocked my table off. He said, I can't get a good table in there. So when well, I right, had the carpenter make this sloop in here, so when he opened the window, he'd be able to get past the table, and he had a big table. So that's what he did there. <coughs> he uh, more or less made things to accommodate the window. Okay, thanks. This is the water going through the house. This is very interesting because when you go into this house, of course you're doing a certain amount of walking. You don't go directly into the house. You walk around it, you go see some of the landscape. So when you get to the house, you walk in the front door, like I said, go into the living room, and once you get in the living room, this is the water going through the basement, actually. And this is below the floor. And, 
well, that water stream goes through the house, and this is like a doorway here, and you uh, take them to. There's a set of stairs going from that entrance, walk down these steps. Now, the group I was with, we all said, this is terrific. And he says, take off your shoes and socks, and you made it fit. So he went down, great, he was very comfortable. Nice cool water, up the ladder, and so forth. But he wanted to miss this. The width of the, the stream, the width of the stream. But the building was about 30 feet wide. So they got on this side and this side. And these uh, levels of floors, they're floating one on top of the other. You don't want anybody to say that's a box. In other words, you want the thing wide open. Right, now, this is uh, one of his, his bedroom. Oh, yeah. This is one of their bedrooms. Now, the first thing that Wright wanted was a bedroom, and the word bed is the word he mentioned. Just for sleeping. He didn't want a big bedroom with, you know, bicycle and all the other stuff. <laughs> you know, a small, small bed. Just where you sleep. And this is the corner. You, you, you can see the views out through here. By the way, this is a Hudson Bay blanket. Now, the Hudson Bay blanket, you probably know, they made up in Canada. But uh, they also had a place in Rensselaer called, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, yeah, Honey Oaks, yeah. And they made them also. So these have been made in Rensselaer for all I know. And this is the little statue and things like that they picked up. The son, the uh, junior, he was a very pretty uh, history major, history of art and so forth. And uh, he studied New York and so forth. And uh, he brought a lot of art with him. He spent a lot of time in it. We had a very good friend of his who was a sculptor and had examples of his stuff in his place. So very much almost like a museum. Beautiful. And another thing about my when he designed the house and all the things that he put into the house, his own personal thinking, he, uh, he designed the furniture. That was his design. He designed the silverware that went to the kitchen. And you're not supposed to change anything. If he comes back, which he does, right? You change anything, you know. <laughs> <laughs> anyways, that's the way he was. All right, think of it. All right, this is the kitchen. The kitchen's a relatively small, it's a preparation kitchen. You can sit a couple of people can sit here. Now this is an oven. It's called an agar oven. It's very expensive. It's made in Sweden. And it has charcoal in there. And they put the charcoal in there in the morning. And they light it. And it stays warm all the time. When a cup of coffee is put on top of it. And that's the way they did it. Of course, in those days, they didn't have gas or anything down there. But that's how they do that stove. And those stones, those shelves, those stoves, are very popular in some places in Europe and so forth. But we had a client one time uh, who wanted to put one of those in his house. He saw all these pictures, and we bought one. And we, it was made up, and we sent from Vermont down to the, the Loudon buildings. But anyway, that's the beautiful apartment. And uh, we had a couple other things in there, which I can mention to you. Uh, Frank Lord Wright was always trying to accommodate uh, Mr. Kaufman. So he, he, while Mr. Kaufman was walking on the site with him, he said to him, uh, Frank, I have to go back to my cottage. I have, I have to go to the bathroom. He says, what do you mean go to the bathroom in the cottage? He says, there's a rock, sit there, and there's water, clean yourself off, and that's all still it. He says, when I built your house, I'll take care of that too. So they had color plumbing pictures. They have a bidet worked into his toilet. Because that was something Mr. Kaufman wanted. He thought that was terrific. All right, this All right now this is the, uh, the levels of the house. And what I want to explain to you is this. The building itself is all rock and very heavy. The center section, that's the staircase in here. But it's a very heavy anchor. And that's what is known as a fulcrum of all these slabs. They, had, they stick out. They're 20, 30 feet, some of them do. And they anchor right into the house. Those railings are real beams. They're strong beams to hold up the slab. So the one, these things that you see radiating from this plate is all part of it. So it's what they call a cantilever. They get 
way on one side of the building kind of right. So that's the way it's made. To give you a feeling that the building's wide open. Now, right, here's an example of the way I'm that you, they go around this little piece and they support that platform. They support this. Interesting. And uh, here it is uh, coming out. Of, this is the staircase in here. And up above her, by the way, was the guest room. All right. This over here is a, a prairie house. And uh, this was one of the first houses in town. He did days in the uh, uh, Chicago area, Dearborn, Michigan. Some of those areas, they had a lot of wealth in there, those days, you know, Carver and so forth. And then one of the big homes. So you notice the horizontal building, you guys. This is horizontal. Themselves, the roof line, large overhead, and so forth. And uh, it had a certain charm that more of us stayed in this area for years. I mean, in the 1930s, this was built. This one, this was built before the 30s, but this is my uh, this picture of the picture, I think. This is, a, as I said before, the Prairie House, which he did so many of. So, uh, <laughs> oh, this is, I showed him some photographs. 
they, they looked along ribbon windows, ending in a corner window, the wide roof overhangs, the brick garden walls, with a carved stone flower room. That was all Mrs. Ciccarelli, Regina, Marie, and I were saying. She, uh, they, they wanted something very similar to what they saw in these pictures. Okay, then we went ahead and showed what we did there. Uh, this is what we did for them. And uh, they were very uh, excited about this thing as far as the entrance. You notice we did the same thing that Wright did. We put a cantilever extension about 12 feet sticking out so the cars, the, part, the passengers could get out and they had to go into the terminal this way. And the uh, driver went around the side to the side. But he was forced to go around the side. The entrance is on the side. And uh, they wanted something that to protect the driver. So we built this cabin for, over here. In fact, it's two cabins, one on top of the other. And there's no columns in here, so you wouldn't have any restriction using these columns to hold up when you stick out this far. It needs to do it. So we built the steel columns out here. And that held up that old thing. And they liked that, that whole thing. Now they got the corner windows up there, and they got the overhang, and they got the windows down the other end, and windows at the same place. They love their house. And uh, so I have that, that picture design that we ended up doing. And, but she based that design on some of these prairie homes, which is a, there's the urn over there. You see that? Mm -hmm. Now there it is. See the little plot on She wanted that in the house because they saw that on one of them photographs that we've got to have that too. And I think if you go over there now, let's show you that. This is what it looks like. Okay, you got an idea of how they want to transport this. Of course, this is a library. But the important thing here is that all these uh, features, all these amenities to the house were incorporated in this funeral. Okay, that's about it as far as I know, but I want to be very, very thankful for his presentation. And I want to mention something to you, which I want to read you. My, progress, my proudest professional award was being the messenger to bring the DNA of America's greatest architect to Albany. Some of his restrictions. 
He also made tighter entrances. Now, we were there, that I was there about 10 years ago, and I was just there in August, took to my son there, because he was an architect. And his he grandson. Grandson, and my grandson. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I took him there. But, you know, if you're a normal person, you feel comfortable. If you're a basketball player, you might have took your head. I don't, know, I don't know if it is, but I'm saying that's the condition here. But you've got to live with it. And you, you know, one thing he always did when he built his house, he always tried to accommodate the owner on the house. And Kaufman had his own pipe stand, and he built a pipe stand for him. You know? Little things that they want to do. He listened to everybody what they want, and he tried to accommodate them. And yes, anything else? Uh, yes. Harris, very, very nice presentation. Oh, well, thank uh, you. What is, what is the cantil the cantilevered balconies consist of? Is it uh, poured concrete? Uh, well, is poured concrete? Uh, depending on each other, but if you talk like about a plate which is what those floors are. Yeah. They're all designed to go withstand the distance that they leave. They go from out of the building. But if you're talking about the railings, those are going to go quite a bit further because they got the heights in there. They had to have the heights to make the strength to go across. Don't, don't now, they put a lot of stress on the building, though? They? Yes, that's what I mentioned before. That's why this tower here, that tower acts, it's like a seesaw, you know? This holds that weight and it has to be designed and engineered properly. Right. Does it have steel beams in it? Well, they had, they had steel beams in some of them. I understand some of the ones where they're, they're reinforced concrete. Things like this in here are probably reinforced concrete. Can I ask one more thing? What is, what is that? Is that a river behind the building? This no, no, no. This violates everything I've ever thought about this building. That, what is that in the back? Well, the building itself, it's built right over the street. This is not showing the street coming out. The other, the other picture is there. But the important thing is, we wanted to integrate the river. Now, this is a pretty good center shot. See, the waterfall goes through here. This sticks out, it's about 30 feet wide from one side to the other. Now, you can see the way this thing is done. This way. Yeah, that's The railings are the strength of that thing projecting out, which is normal. The further out you go, the stronger ground. Anything else? Yes. Yeah, probably, yeah. What, what's the status of the house today? Did the Kaufman sell it? Is it on the National Register? And who, who runs the house now? Well, I'll tell you about that. It's very interesting. When I was originally there, the place was a house. They were living there. When we went there, we asked permission to go to the house. They said only during the week. Because on the weekend they had parties going on. So we didn't want to disturb that. And that was in 1946. And in 46 to about 1960, that was a private home. And then they put it into a, a historic registry. And it became the foundation. So if you want to go there, you come there as a tourist, you make a reservation, they go in there, and they give you a certain time and you can go through it. Now, if it was a house, that was just a uh, usable house. They wouldn't let people go through the private home. But you have to go to the tour guide who watches, make sure nobody gets hurt or anything like that. So it's very well restricted. And they had millions of people going through the house over the years. I'm uh, talking about from the time it became a foundation. Yes. The Pennsylvania Land Trust actually. Yeah, Pennsylvania Land Trust owns it now. Finley, can they have a question? I'm one of those tall people who was there. Yeah. <laughs> and I was hitting the ceiling in two <laughs> locations. Uh -huh. Once inside the big house and once up at the guest house. Yeah. I was just brushing along the ceiling. I was one inch taller then than I am now. So maybe I wouldn't have that experience now. <laughs> but anyway, well, I when I was through, I said to the tour guide, Thank you for showing me the house, but I don't think I'm going to take it because <laughs> I'm too tall. <laughs> 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 Are there any members of the Coffin family alive now? Are there any members of the family alive now? The Coffin family. No. Are you, that was a question. Are there any members of the Coffin family alive today? I don't think so. No. There was a. Uh, no. Yes, no. Do you remember he didn't marry? He was an only child. Yeah, he was an only child. 
You showed some beautiful photographs, which were wonderful. Uh, could you comment a little bit about the actual living space? Like how many rooms? Was there a den, a library, that kind of thing? Well, they had about three bedrooms on the main level. Use the bedroom. Use the, use the microphone. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, they had uh, three le there was three levels. There was the main level, which you came in, which was off grade. And then there was a layer above, which was more of you of, well, it was a bedroom. And, uh, Mr. Kaufman had a, Mr. Kaufman Jr. had a room that's up. The one I showed you, a very small room. And they had a double bed accommodation for Mr. and Mrs. Kaufman on the next floor. And uh, then they had a couple of guest houses. When we were there in 1946, they were building guest houses up on top of the hill. And um, I think there must have been about four, four or five guest houses that were putting up, plus for the staff that was maintained continuously. Um, as far as what they did there, I would assume because of people like yourself, as far as the heights, they probably accommodate that, because they know who the guests are going to be. But I'm just saying, on the basic house, they designed it for the Kaufman family. And apparently, Mr. Kaufman Jr., he was fairly tall. He was close to six feet. Yes. Harris, did, did, the, uh, uh, did, did Wright uh, continue this uh, cantilevered uh, approach in his Western uh, architecture, uh, Arizona, the uh, architecture out in Arizona? Oh, yeah. Well, there's, there's was a number of examples. I gave you an example of the latest one in 58, which was uh, Guggenheim. But they're all cantilevered platforms, most of those. But he did an awful lot of things out in Arizona, out in California. I mean, you can go on the road to get a report on his house, and you had to spend a week because it's such a great field. And how much did this cost? Oh, in those days, I'll tell you, that's an amazing thing. They had all local labor to work on this stone. It didn't cost about 150000 but don't forget the landscaping and all the stuff in here. Plus, they had trucks. We have they have pictures of people walking around with going up and down that road there and so forth. Our parking lot when we were there could accommodate maybe 20 cars or 30 cars. I think now there's, there's a whole section out there of people coming in. But that's only in the tourist center. That's a separate building and you go through there and then you get your guide and you go through. Yes. I, uh, I don't have a question. I just want to make a comment that you, this is kind of a bittersweet uh, lecture for me because for years I've gone down Delaware and looked at that building. And I always saw strange design for a funeral house. <laughs> and of course the library took it over. And I always, I did have Art 101 at the State University and Frank Boy Life was part of it. And all clear, this is an iconic building. And I kept looking at this thing and I wondered, that's Frank Lloyd Wright. <laughs> <laughs> that did it. That's my reward, I said. No, but I'm, what I'm serious about is that this is not, this is on you. You go to Chicago. We went to Chicago and saw You see four of the Unity Temple, which is a beautiful building, and the Larkin Building, a whole bunch. Of, they're all about something like this. Did you design more buildings on this Prairie Style for this area? Our house. <laughs> <laughs> Where is it? <laughs> yes. Yeah. yes. Ellen's got my Carol. How did the weather affect the stream? Pardon me? How did the weather affect the stream? How, How did the weather? the stream affected by the weather under the house? Oh, that's no problem. The, the, the house covered the stream. Right. On the way going through, once you got out there, as you're on your own. No, I mean the weather, the temperature. Condensation. Freezing. Oh, I don't know. They've had maintenance problems, like all his buildings. He's in a Johnson Wax Company out in the city of Wisconsin. And there's always had leaks in the roof. He did a big synagogue in Philadelphia. They had all glass, and that had leaks, too. You know? Yes. So you explained how. When he was under oath and testifying, he was very good at what he did, and his buildings are unique. But when you look at them, the stone and concrete, they look like they'll last for a thousand years. Was that part of his intent as well, to make them last? Well, I'll tell you something about falling water. The glass and falling water, you're talking about the glass? No, no, they last. The whole right. building. 
of how it would last was just a passing. The class was made in France, ANSI France, who shipped over here because we didn't make that clear glass to miter and so forth. Yes? How long did they last? I don't know. The Watkin building, which is in Buffalo, they tore that building down a couple of years ago. It's unfortunate. It's a beautiful building. Somebody decided to buy it, and um, who knows? And the, the, uh, the hotel in uh, Scottsdale, uh, the uh, Biltmore, Biltmore Hotel. I don't know if you've been there. Yes. Oh, it's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's one of his, and that's, you know, I think it's still around. Oh, yes. Yes. All right, uh, if you're talking about the kitchen, uh, he's very much efficiency conscious. You go from your refrigerator to the sink and then you get the oven. And he wants everything pretty much in reach because he's like a short order book, you know. That's the way he, <laughs> you know, he, didn't, he didn't do like they do today, you know, a center up thing. The center aisle didn't give you a lot of room around there, which is wasted, but, and all these things. He didn't believe in any of that stuff in those days. They just they just did things like that. But he, he's done hotels and places, you know, large kitchens and so forth, but this particular person wanted an efficiency type house. David, does, does is all the rural land that you mentioned at the beginning, does that all stay, or do they sell that off? The it's rural land around It's 1,500 square feet, I'll be 1,500 acres there in that area. Still rural? Pardon me? Still rural? Did it maintain yeah, it? it's rural, but don't forget, we've got tourists coming in there. They have a million or so tourists in one sometimes. They go through those places. When we were there in August, was it August? August, we were there. There was a... You know, if one bus comes in and another one goes out, it's like a real tourist. And by the way, the Palestinian, am I right? East, they have the same thing there. Palestinian. Yeah. Excuse me. Uh, you're not busy with me. You've got a question over here, yeah. The Imperial yes. Hotel in Tokyo wasn't destroyed by the earthquake, but wasn't it eventually demolished? What was yeah, the yeah, hotel in Tokyo? Yeah. Was it actually demolished? I don't know. Yeah. All I know it was one of the busiest places when it was finished. And of course, it stayed finished after the earthquake. They needed the land. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Hoffman, I think you may have Oh, there's no problem if you want to do it. You're building a bridge, actually. Yeah. I thought for a garden, like, it depends on what creek and stream you have. Uh, normally, there's a setback rule in, uh, in zoning in towns and towns. That's the where so. we got. It was just over at uh, Crystal Bridges, for example, in Arkansas. And it's built all on top of these streams. I yeah. can imagine. It can be done. That's very easy. Vermont, you've got to build the 100 yards back from the creek. Right. And, and also around here. Yeah, you got a question? Yes, sure. Actually, it has to relate to both of these water type questions. Um, Albany has uh, some streams that are partly underground and partly free flowing. And during the tremendous storm, uh, Irene, uh, the city engineer, the water was worried, very worried, that the water coming down would be too much to go through the closed in parts and start flowing over the top. And I was wondering, they've never had a problem like that at all. Oh, well, well, actually, you gotta remember, this is not something that's done for right. a very economic way. Well, I'm sorry, this is not something done for a renewal job. This is a pretty much, they have plenty of finances as far as building it goes. So what they did there, which is a normal thing, is they had a flooding condition. They had deviating streams that came off it to release this thing. 
They never designed something that would actually flood. I mean, this is something that was practically designed. So they designed it to handle a flood? They didn't, they didn't have a flood. They, I don't know of any flood they had, but I'll be honest with you. I was there three times already, and each time I know there was repairs made to the area, and they always had good maintenance on that place. Yes? Anybody else? Another question? Of course, comment. Yes, Dave. Don. Going back to the Ciccarelli funeral. Oh, uh, yeah. In the paper several months back, they created a sculpture out of the Delaware Avenue streetcar track. Yeah, that is located. I haven't been there, but located on that property. That's very nice. I'm glad to hear that. It should be. It should be. There is another question, Dr. Cole. Harris, is this near, uh, is the location of this uh, falling water anywhere near Johnstown, Pennsylvania? Uh, yes. It is near. I know the area. Is. That's, That's a little bit of a flood. It's not on the yeah, it's it's not this, this is. Yeah. Uh, Mike, yeah. this, this is uh, in the flood, not in the flood plain or anything like that. This is a very nice sloping site. Yes. When you drive down there, it's like little rural roads and so forth, the general store and all that stuff. This is in Bear Run. Yeah. And then the, it's like a little farmed area, you know. It was very, very beautifully, uh, as far as contours go, the scopes, I mean, the sloping areas and so forth. It's a beautiful area. Like, if you're interested, you, you can go visit these areas. There's a number you can call for a reservation right. if you want to go through it. I strongly suggest you do it. Yes. Question here. I was just going to add comment. If you do have the opportunity to go, it feels so current for a building that was built you know, so long ago. Uh, one of the things I saw that you didn't mention, but you built, it, you built in many bookcases, just like the window uh, that you had shown and the built-in desk. Uh, going around the entire living room were bookcases that were kind of built into the. Uh, so it's very functional and organic, as you were saying. It's a wonderful place to go see. Yeah, but I think if you go there, you'll get the sensation. Now, to appreciate the open air, they do have certain walls, all stone, the natural stone, which is in the hill. And I think the contrast of this openness is more pronounced that way. Jonathan, any question? Yeah, I was wondering how the uh, fishing worked out. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you something. That stream is long enough that you can find another spot to sit there and fish. <laughs> <laughs> what about the sound of the water? Oh, it's, it's a nice. very wonderful thing to, to, to be near a brook. Well, it's relaxing. Are you hearing throughout the house? No, not necessarily. In the area that they have the steps going down, that thing is open up most of the time. It doesn't bother me. I don't think it does. But they like it. They used to like that little hole. You know, they fixed that hole for some reason. We were there last time. It wasn't there. We've got a lot of time for about two more questions. In the back and then up to Al. Uh, just skimming through the book, I noticed that the chairs were very different. I don't know if you can comment about it or not. They were like a square shape. And then the seat itself was framed in. I thought it's different. You know, it felt like it matches the structure of the house itself. But I don't know how comfortable they were. Right. Well, <laughs> this is about furniture. Some of their designs here were copied by many uh, furniture companies, in particular North Carolina. They have a Frank Lloyd Wright selection, you know, of his designs. Of course, I, that, I don't. And anybody who has one of those, if they don't feel comfortable with something else, I'm not sure. But I'm saying that the kind of a design, he designed it pretty much for Mr. Kaufman. Right. You wanted to see how it's That's why they were lower, they were matching right. his height. Is this one? Because to me, it felt a little bit a short chair. But maybe not for him. I didn't think about that. <laughs> and the toilets are low, too. <laughs> Just as a matter of fact, uh, just as a matter of fact, we spoke with Edgar Toffel, the architect that was working on Paul Noir, and he says, Mr. Wright always watched 
what Mr. Kaufman did, the height, he took the height of measurements and everything. So whatever he wanted, and like I said before, his place to put his pipe, a little stand, pretty much was done. We have time to get one more, Alex? Uh, near Falling Water is another right house, oh, right. Kentucky Knock. I'm wondering if uh, you visited that and any comments you might have about it. You want to say it again, Al? Yeah. There's another right house near Falling Water called Kentuck Knob. And I'm wondering whether you had visited Kentuck Knob. Where is where? It's just uh, a little south of Falling Water, uh, not far from it, maybe 15 minute drive. What's it open? Kentuck Knob. You don't know. Anything else? Well, thank you.